It's like our, a TVPC thing. Yeah, right primary Vit Valley Planning, Planning Commission. Commission. It's focused on like um, stormwater retention, right. new technology applications for in tree planting. So Jonathan Smith from Tetra Tech Engineering is going to be facilitating the workshop. So how about if, if you know, you be the hub for whatever. Okay. To make sure that. Yeah, if anyone somebody. wants to go in their carpool that wants to happen, then yeah. it's contact law. Sound good? Yeah. Okay, and then the last thing on my chair report is that uh, Jay, Rich, and I just met with some representatives at Forbes about the trees that's climbing pin oaks in front of the property there. And it was a good introductory meeting. We had a couple of members of the trustees, the facilities manager, the director. It's interesting to see what their priorities were and how they sometimes didn't mesh completely with ours. Like they really don't want to lose any lawn space to trees because they do programming on one of the lawns. So that was a, a you know something that well I think that they'll need to we'll need to all come to a little bit of a center point on because we have utility wires that bump up there too. And it's not really conducive to planning, uh, to replacing those shade trees in the exact same spots um, without providing a little more setback. But nevertheless, they, you know, were, it was great to see that they have a tree committee forming. They're thinking about it. They want to they get some recommendations for us from us about varieties. They want to hear some budget numbers. It was a good first meeting. I think so. I think it was good just to get to meet, meet everyone. Yeah. Actually kind of get an idea of what they're looking to do. We had no idea going in there what they were really looking at. So right, we, right. Have some, we have some homework to do. And then uh, we will probably circle back. I think we'll have a meeting with them again. You know, I, we didn't actually uh, end on that, but I, I'm happy to schedule something online. Okay. Yeah, because I do feel like we, we, we should have a, something, a, a next step. So the goal is to increase the canopy there? Well, I mean, they're, 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 you know the pin oaks in the front, they're, a number of them are, are really on their way out. Mm -hmm. So it's to plan succession. And, and they did say on different parts of the property, they'd be happy to accept more trees based on our recommendations. So. I'm not sure that, they're, that um, at this point, if their highest priority is to increase the canopy. I think it's to you know, maintain a certain character. And um, I think I think they like trees, but I think they're uh, they want to maintain sight line. They want to maintain view of the library, um, and they want they don't want trees to interfere with utility. I mean, with um, programming. So yeah. a lot of conflicting yes. things that yeah. aren't really going to mesh with. I think we've got to work on them a little bit. Work on them a little bit. <laughs> I, I do too. I, I would agree. I think we kind of have to kind of guide them in a direction that they're they will all be amenable to it and all the trustees can vote to actually or show or present the realistic options sure. yeah yeah and i think uh you know i think the director had, had a very narrow vision of what she was comfortable with with trees um you know more narrower than than the trustees that's the sense i got at least the two trustees were there for her she really didn't want to lose an inch of lawn space and I, 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 I think we can, I think we can reason with her, um, because I don't think that it's an either or thing. I've had that conversation so many times with so many people. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. you, you can always get that. Yeah. There's a. Oh, sorry. But that's it. It's just it's there's, a common concern. <laughs> there's a. Um, I don't know if this may be helpful to relay information to like lay people. There's a. Davy Tree has a tree calculator that's pretty, um, not just like dollar value of the tree, but kind of in a graphic form shows like how much carbon it sequesters, how much storm water, how much pollutants, mm -hmm. how much, you know, mm -hmm. it offers. So it sometimes um, it just kind of wakes people up to, you know, what those pin oaks are doing there now, you know. And okay, let's get rid of them to have more lawn space, but you're going to lose. Like, well, that's really what they're doing in addition to aesthetics and whatever. Well, also, if, 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 yeah, if they're drawing that conclusion based on pin oaks, then that makes sense. But if you're drawing it based on another tree that has a much higher canopy that provides shade as opposed to spiky things at your eyes, mm -hmm. then that would be yeah, yeah. a different mm -hmm. way to approach that. But they have like this nice graphic thing that comes up in people. Right. You know? 
Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Thanks. All right, that's it for my chair report. Um, tree ward report. So the nursery, let's start off with the, let's start with the nursery update. Um, so Jay and I traveled out today to uh, a location um, out on Glendale Road, which is uh, about 19 acres of city-owned property that is called the Fedora property that was uh, part of the land acquisition when the city was trying to expand the landfill. So I have a, a rendering of it. I only have one though because this is not our map actually. Andy and I are working on getting it's a solar map. It's a solar map. So we're, all, we're we've got a little conflict here, but I think <laughs> I think that we may be able to actually carve out uh, a couple of potential sites here that we could actually have a nursery on. Um, and there is it is city-owned property. There's no uh, deed restriction of any kind. Um, it is. And I'll pass this around so folks can look at it. Um, it you know, Jay and I just walked around today to, to take a look at it. Um, and I think really what, you know, Amoresco, Amoresco has signed a tentative agreement to actually have uh, 20 years worth of uh, 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 solar panels here and on top of the landfill in this flat area. So we would end up actually, hopefully getting with the mayor's approval to utilize this parcel you know, it's all one parcel, but there's two, two locations. This is the most optimal one because of this, the direct sunlight, and there's also partial shade here. This is the other option down below, uh, which actually has, um, it's more shaded. Um, and then there's a huge piece in the front that actually is the frontage on Glendale Road, and I think the city is interested in trying to sell those buildings. Those lots. So I think it would be, if we decide that this would be the best location, um, then it would be important for us to actually uh, you know, identify the area that we actually want to have the nursery in. Um, work with Amoresco because obviously any kind of trees we plant here um, could be, could shade their, um, their panels. However, they won't be in there it's not great. long. Yeah. So that's, that's a good thing. These, or, these uh, orangey yellow areas are actually areas of where the Amoresco is, is proposing they do tree removal. So there is no shading of these panels to maximize their efficiency. Um, and so, you know, Amoresco is, this is pretty, this, this project is pretty well locked in, so we kind of have to work around them. But I'd like to, if this parcel will work, I'd like to secure this with a, like a long-term, even though it is city property, like a long-term lease of some sort. So I think the mayor is interested, in, very interested in the idea of having a city tree nursery, but he also would like to be, actually have a proposed site, but also a business plan to go with it as to how we're going to maintain it, who's going to maintain it, how much is it going to cost, uh, how many trees are going to be in there, how many trees will actually, uh, uh, how long will it take for the trees to turn over to become city street trees, you know, versus buying trees like we are presently. How, how big is the optimal area? A couple of acres. Yeah, a couple, probably about three acres. It's a big yeah. yeah, that's a lot of space. Sort of water. Uh, there's water out on Glendale, uh, Glendale Road, so we actually have to run a seasonal water service into there. The other, op the other, op the other thing that may happen as well is that if they do sell this um, as a building lot or two building lots out here, our access will change. You'll have to go through the landfill. Um, there is a road that goes along the side here, but I don't think that they would probably. It wouldn't be really suitable building lot if you had an access road for folks to be driving around, so that may change over time. But there's no RFP put together for this property for selling it or anything, so that's in the future. But I've been kind of instructed by the director uh, that this portion of the back would be available. He's already had a conversation with I have not talked to the mayor about this. This might seem like a crazy idea, but what if someone approached Amoresco about using the area that's going to be cleared for shade to, to provide solar access? Because I mean, ideally, the goal is to never let them get too big. Right. You know, I guess like they might have the concern that we would be derelict in our responsibilities and they would eventually get too big. But I mean, if they're clearing it anyway and they don't want trees there and we don't want our trees to get too big, then that, I mean, we might like be with, like too much of a wrinkle in the whole discussion if there's already a lot of stuff. Well, the area there. we're looking at is already clear. Oh, yeah? Yes. Okay. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah. So this is all, this area is a huge. I don't know, probably a good, I would say a good five to 10 acres maybe yeah. in here. 
we didn't walk all the way across here, but this actually, if this solar array was in here, this would be really some prime real estate for any type of uh, nursery. It's just like we're just questioning the soils a little bit, I think, to make sure they're pretty sandy. So my next question, what was the soil like? Well, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna actually take some, spend some time to go out there and uh, take some soil samples and some of the mass to kind of see what we're up against to see. We found about between eight and 12 inches of organic matter and then sand underneath that. Mm -hmm. That sounds it's not the worst. Nice. Yeah. It's not the worst thing for no. a What's the? No, we thought we could till in some, add in some. Yeah, well, what's the plan for the eight inches where the solar array is gonna go? The, the plan for? The topsoil. Uh, underneath there? Yeah. I have no idea. You uh, strip it. We, we, have, we, have, we, have, we, haven't, we haven't got that far yet. Uh, It'll probably be, a, they'll probably gravel or yeah. stone the whole base, so strip the topsoil and put it on yeah. the nursery soil. Wow. So, so part of the RFP package for that could be that the city gets to keep the topsoil. Hmm. And we'll just be it's about it's convenient that. too. It's for them, they wouldn't have to move it for the cost. Like I said, Amoresco, this is there. So what I did is I gave this. Uh, map to Andy and Amoresco actually is going to send Andy their GIS layer so Andy Keither can actually fill in uh, with some approximate sizes and shapes as to where the nursery would be so we actually have so we can actually talk to Amoresco as well uh, to say that we're interested in doing this what's your, what are your thoughts what are your concerns is this going to be a problem because this deal is not totally locked in stone with Amoresco there's no signed contract with them but they have been basically they have like a letter of intent, let's say, uh, from the mayor's office to allow them to do this for 20 years. Uh, this would also provide, I think, kind of a nice buffer, I think, for the neighbors uh, if we did have a nursery in there. Even though there is somewhat of a buffer um, right here already, there's a pre-existing good-sized buffer. But even if this was here, this would be a little better. Uh, and there's buffers all the way around the property for everyone else. So. So that's yeah. If it's, everything's harvested, well, you know, if it's under ten feet, probably it's going to be fine. And that's hard to get to. Is it fenced off? No, it's not hard to get to. At the moment, you can actually drive right along this property line. There's like an access road that goes into this field. You just drive around the field. There's no way to They'll probably have an access all the way around the solar array too. Correct. Yeah. And I think eventually, if they do sell the property, they will have an access from the yeah. landfill road. They'll just drive up and over because it's. Yeah. Can build right on top of it very easily. Yeah, the car trucks have to get around that. So, so that's kind of where we really haven't looked at any other sites. Water access. Water access. Most of the sites we're talking about are are uh, other uh, constraints, deed constraints as well, mm -hmm. because most of the properties the conservation commission has some kind of deed restriction of some sort. This one does not. We just bought the property and demoed the house. The, the DPW. And what's the advantage of this over where the, uh, like the overgrown nursery is at Smithville right now? Uh, the fact that we would actually have the, the city, we would, have, would have control oh, over the government. Oh, I got yeah. it, yeah. So if I we see. could enter into Rather a long-term, if yeah. we could get a long-term agreement from the president administration to have this nursery here, then I would feel yeah. a lot more comfortable I got actually it. doing that at Smithville. Yes. Because administrators change, things mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. 20 years out of the department, so you're asking me, it's just, you know, just trying to avoid right, those kind of things. Right. So, not that it would happen, but, and we own it, so we can we can kind of, it's more melvable, I think. Mm -hmm. It's just the only thing that, you know, one thing I don't like, and I just really mentioned this was the fact that it's far away. Yeah. It's far away for folks, so if we have a volunteer cadre of people that actually want to do the work to help us maintain this nursery, you know, it's just going to require. Sure. Um, yeah, different, different, different transportation than it would be if it was locally, mm -hmm. you know, local within. It is in bike riding distance, but you're going to bike ride yes. five yeah. spades and two wheelbarrows. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. The other option is to actually build a shed there and actually have all the tools, the uh, tools in the shed and then allow folks to have keys, sort of like they do the community gardens. Every gardener gets a key and the lawnmowers and everything else are stored in the building and they just go out and do their thing and when they're done, they go home. That's a good option. So that would be another, another uh, you know, there's just no real bicycle path to this place. But there are bike lanes on Route 66, so. What's the address, Rich? Uh, to be honest with you, I would have to look What's it up. Glendale Road? I there it is. <laughs> is it on there? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very good. <laughs> 170. I'm not sure. I think that's the landfill, but we can just call it 170. Uh -huh. So, 
I don't know if I'm going to pass this round, so we're good. So I guess uh, hopefully by next meeting I'll have a little, we'll have a, uh, an actual, maybe I could actually send you um, the GIS information via email so you can actually take a look at it. And then in the meantime, I'll do the soil samples and we'll just, mm -hmm. just kind of keep. And I don't know, Lily, would it be um, to formulate a business plan for something like that's down the road would be good to have a couple of commissioners kind of work on this? Yeah, group. yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I, you know, the I think the compelling thing to the mayor is going to be that we demonstrate that the cost of this is lower, the net cost is lower than us continuing to buy from nurseries and the quality of the trees. So, like, there's an overall net benefit. So, um, but yeah, that'll take some research and some people so really good with what I did this summer I can mm -hmm. share that with you just on budgeting stuff but it's basically just the rootstock itself you know it's getting more expensive to get rootstock so you know 400 trees was like 10,000 bucks for a rootstock so I think 400 was like 10,000 bucks you know, 10, yeah for buying them bare root you know whips and there aren't many places I'll provide them to you but when you take I mean most of our expenses were like for fencing and irrigation and like that so we ended up spending like nine thousand dollars you know when we and that and there was like a big piece of equipment that we had to buy too but you know over if it's just like a one year if it's just like a put them in the ground and take them out and then you don't ever replace anything then you end up breaking even but ideally we're like maintaining it so mm -hmm. I think as time goes forward the cost is supposed to go it should go down okay. well it sounds like you have some familiarity with this I have a preference, and I do think the grow bag system is the way to go. Hey, Chris. Hello, Welcome. Do you want to pull up a chair? Sure. It just, it just makes sense to have a big piece of machinery that you have to mark and leave yeah. out there. Okay, so Andrew, do you feel like you would have some time to contribute to putting your, uh, some thought into this? Yeah, I can just share all my, okay. all my RFPs and everything I did with, with Rich. And just going to pull from there. Anyone else? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Okay, great. The main benefit for the city is going to be the uh, variety of plant material and uh, mm -hmm. quality. Mm -hmm. I, I agree based upon what we experienced this year alone, mm -hmm. just, you know, catching catching the tail end or trying to muscle in and get some trees in basically the middle of the season. So. And yeah, and then I think we're really going to give some thought into um, the sustainability of this. You know, there's a lot of initial volunteer zeal for any, the, for the groundbreaking of any mm -hmm. project. But then as it sort of becomes old and ordinary, what's our ongoing plan for maintaining the site, mowing, watering, making sure that trees are circulate so they don't get bigger than we can handle. So those are all, all things that will need to be considered. Um, do we have a timeline on this, Rich? Um, I personally would like to see us have this all wrapped up by the spring. I, I, I would really like to find a way to see if we can actually get this measured up and running. And smiling at me. That'd be great. No, I'm just saying, like, that would be such an amazing first year. Yeah, you know? what? It's like, well, I mean, just actually getting the site secured and getting all the paperwork done and the business plan done would be an accomplishment and a half. And then actually, you know, then, you know, working with NRS to try to figure out what they're going to do with their topsoil and how we're going to amend the soils and what we're going to do would all be something that we would actually do after we have the approval from the mayor's office to go ahead and, and do this project. And then if we are not able to plant any variable trees in the spring, then, you know, we might to the fall. I know it sounds pretty aggressive, but I, I guess I think after this time experience with this plant in here, it would be really nice to at least have this in the wings, and then we will have four years of more trees we're going to have to purchase yeah. from somewhere else right. until we can start to cycle through yeah. the nursery. I don't, I don't know what your thoughts, Andrew. I think, I think 2017 might be more realistic when it comes to actually getting the stuff from yeah. the growers, because you'd have to have everything ordered in February and then planted in April. You have to do it in the spring. Yeah, it can't be done. It can't be done in the fall. No. But I think that all the work that it takes to develop a site, secure a site, get funding, 
I think that's a lot of work. And I think getting all that stuff finished in time to place an order, you know, in the fall of 2016 and have everything ready to roll in 2017. Yeah, I think that's. I think the site prepared already and ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. I think two years is realistic. Okay, you can, uh, Marilyn, you can add me to that all list right. of people thinking about the nursery. And then um, we have Chris in five minutes. Um, do you have I'll a few just, other things? I will just be very quick. Okay. Um, can I ask a quick question on that? Um, I'm sorry you already said it, but what, what is the history of that parcel then? That parcel belonged to the Fedora family. It was a long, they had been there for I don't know, 40 years, Jay. Long time. Long time. And uh, they uh, have some. Uh, when the city was trying to expand the landfill, there are some contamination issues in the back of the property that's related to the old landfill. So the city uh, bought their property from them to kind of settle the whole situation. And so the, the DPW has held onto that property and then thus we have not had the expansion to the landfill. So we have 19 acres of land that really is just kind of sitting idle. We mow it once a year. So, um, it's all clear, it was, he had a horse farm there. Yeah, sorry, he had a horse farm, there was a house, there were some barns in the back. Uh, I, did, I, didn't, I didn't know him, Jay, Jay, know, Jay had been over there multiple times, but, so. Uh, I, just a couple of quick things. Uh, a list of trees planted, I am still updating the map. So what I'm, I'm doing is I'm gonna try to update the map of all the trees that we have planted, the Google map Google that everyone has access to. And you know that, that there's a link on mm -hmm. our site to yeah. that map. And then what I'm gonna have, Andy is uh, so kindly offered to take that and migrate all that into GIS, right. which will then afford us the ability to have a spreadsheet yeah. very easily instead of me actually typing or writing by hand every tree that's planted. So, so far we've planted since the beginning of October 80 trees. Right. And we have 16 left. And then Rob and I have met yesterday, and I'm sure we're probably going to touch on this later on in the meeting about what we're going to do with the remaining ones because I think we're talking about additional fall plantings. So we'll just, I'll leave that off to that. Yep. Um, the other, two other issues is uh, the city did receive a check from uh, the uh, homeowners of uh, Seven Adair Place for the mitigation for the loss of that 11 and a half inch uh, um, silver maple to the mm -hmm. tune of uh, $1,633.28. So now we have over almost $11,000 at our disposal providing a client account to put it in. Well, tell them why we have close to $10,000 other dollars. I don't think you've told, you've only told me. Oh, I don't told you. I, oh. yeah, I'm, I'm our our, our, our uh, individual at uh, 191 Spring Street walked in the DPW office with a check for $9,500 last week. Last week oh. Do you remember this is the guy yeah. that removed trees oh, yeah. illegally? Yeah. Yeah. So he paid his fine in full. And so I'm working with Susan Wright and uh, Joyce Karpinski to set up a, an account waiting to hear back from uh, their uh, the auditing contact person in Boston to see if we can set up a revolving account that we can deposit these checks and we can be used for all true related um, issues. Great. So way to go for Rich for holding the line. No, yeah. yeah now see well said there's a new warden in town. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what he meant by that. <laughs> have to give you a little, little sheriff style. Uh, <laughs> I would love for us to pull this table out so we can have Chris be part of this circle. So one other thing is that um, I had a request from uh, the homeowners at uh, 623 Kennedy Road. Um, they are requesting a new driveway. Uh, which I sent everybody, I forwarded everybody the communications. Okay, so everyone's yeah. pretty well. Aware. I don't know if you had a chance to read it, but. So the homeowners, and this is again a, an interesting dynamic of how the planning board communicates in a sense to residents because this gentleman had to go for a site plan approval because of the uh, water protection district that his property was in, and there's an intermittent stream on there as well. Um, so the planning board approved his driveway, and there was just one line in there in their uh, uh, conditions that say that uh, you know all trees in the public right away are at the jurisdiction of the Department of Public Works. So unfortunately, it gave Mr. Eastman really like no direction. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, I think what ha I did meet with him beginning in the in the uh, early summer, and the way that I left it with him is that I asked him to have his contractor come on and actually stake out his driveway because basically his plan was already completed 
and um, the plan that I originally had did not show all the contours and all the grading and all the changes to their property that abuts uh, the road, so there are more public shade trains to be removed than I think he anticipated. So he's a little frustrated if you read the emails, I think you'll kind of gather that. So that's kind of the history behind it. So my next step is to go out and actually identify all the public shade trees that are there, measure them all, and try to come up with a figure for him about either uh, you know, a mit mitigating the removals, or planting trees in kind, or not doing anything, which is not an option for him. I had a question when I was reading yes. that correspondence. So, um, I do want to I do want to make this short because it or kind of bumping into Chris. Don't, don't worry. And Chris wanted to leave. You wanted to leave right at... I thought I was going to have my daughter with me. Oh, okay. She's off. Oh, all right. Doing something else. So. <laughs> okay. Yep. Good, good. Um, they, they were pitching it as a safety issue, like in the name of safety. Well, can, they, they are. They are. It can, so can a safety issue override um, the it, otherwise... Sight, sight line distance. So I have the ability to tell someone that we have a sight line distance here and there's no... It circumvents public shade tree hearing, but I am not going to do that in this case because the sight line issue is really the whole road. So when the gentleman drives out of his driveway, the way Kenny Road comes down, he comes down like this and he goes down and his driveway is right here. So his real sight line issue is the right hand side and the problem that he has is his driveway is about a, probably a 10 percent grade. So in the winter time when he's at the top of his driveway and he has to stop to look for a car and there's snow on the ground and there is no car or there is a car, he has to back all the way up and do it all over again. Mm -hmm. So he's constantly doing this. I thought it was a 30% grade. That, that would be like a roller coaster. <laughs> no, I, I, I would say it's probably 10% it's probably and it was actually built prior to um, the changes in the percentage that the DBW has for driveways at this point. So mm -hmm. that driveway would not be acceptable. So that driveway construction now would not be acceptable. That where it actually needs the street line. Can you put one of those like convex mirrors up, you know? The hill drop, his driveway's below the hill, so the hill's up here, so, so it would, I don't think it would help. So, no, yeah. the bottom line is that I feel like this issue is fully in the tree warden's hand. This is not a tree commission issue at this point. I mean, if, you know, I, I didn't know if they were going to make her parents stay in front of us. They just chose not to. I invited them to come, but I, but at this point, I mean, I, I, I feel like this, this is, you know, dictated by state law the you know the, the future of those healthy trees and that and if we want to then after this is resolved how you see fit talk about the larger policy issues of you know what to do when there are conflicts of healthy trees and road safety and so forth we can have that conversation but I don't really want us to get in the nitty-gritty of this particular case can I ask one question though mm -hmm. when did our policy get developed in reference to Winner's application was followed and his approval was granted. The policy of MGL Chapter 87 has been on the books forever. I mean like the, 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 fee. the fee. The fee is something that I've instituted myself that I am still needing some more, I'm needing the whole policy approved by the mayor's office. Okay. So I have been kind of, in a sense, making residence in a, in a sense without. That's okay, you don't have No, it's fine. I mean, it's the, the truth of the matter is not having a real true policy or a true ordinance to work off of. Which is exactly the way Amherst operates. That's cool. That's, that's so I don't think what we're doing is completely, you know, out, out of the ballpark. No. And then if someone objects, that sends, yeah. that sends everything right out the window. So he could have a great plan in place to pay for mitigation that, that I could agree to. Maybe not mitigate every single tree that's lost there, but mitigate maybe the majority, and it would be acceptable. But if one, resi if one resident objects to the public shade tree hearing, then that changes the dynamics of it anyways. But, yeah. So... But we're going to we're going to see this over and over again, in part because the submittal requirements are not consistent across different applications. Right. The fact that you have to go in and tag public shade trees is not necessarily correct. That should be done by the property owner and the uh, engineer who's designing the plan. It so should I, be on the site plan too. It should be on the site plan, and I think that's where the issue is. I should I think I should have brought it on this conversation mm -hmm. prior to it. Yeah. The planning board approving it. Or I actually would have reviewed it instead of the planning board approving it and then I'm reviewing it after the fact. So do I need to invite um, someone from either the planning department or the planning board back in to have to so we can get in front of this? Um, you you could or we could actually just have a conversation with Wayne. Wayne and see okay. where that goes. All right. Because it would make it would make a little more sense. Okay. 
All right. And that's it. I'm not talking about all semester. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well then, um, well then, I will turn to our next agenda item. Chris, thank you for coming. I know that I, I saw on my iPhone that you sent me an email recently. I'm for some reason not able to get on the public Wi-Fi in here. So oh, okay. I don't know why, but I've tried and tried, rebooted my computer, I cannot get on the public Wi-Fi. Is anyone else on the public Wi-Fi, Terry? No, I'm not on it. Um, so I was not able to, if you sent me something, I was not able to share okay. it. With okay, okay. It was the, I'll go over, it was it were the, uh, the engineering uh, feasibility studies of the parking lots. Okay, all right. right. So, um, just to um, say the obvious, Chris Mason is City of Northampton's Energy and Sustainability Officer. And um, among other things, he's helped bring um, solar, a lot of uh, uh, TV solar into the city, and is working on a big project at some of the schools for PV arrays, is that right, JFK? Oh, in parking lots. Park, um, city, and school, city and school parking lots. We, we looked at, we've got an engineering study done of many city and school parking lots to see which ones might be feasible for PV arrays on canopies mm -hmm. over the cup over the uh, parking lots. And one of the reasons I invited Chris in, first of all, I wanted to um, just establish that I think we all share the common greater goal of um, energy efficiency, either through conservation um, or through energy generation. Kind of, we, see that we're, we, we see ourselves a little bit more on the conservation side, and you're more on the generation side, although you do a... Oh, no, no, it's Yeah, they, you do they're, a... They're, they're yes. yes. Um, no, conservation. Well, I don't know any trees that are actually generating energy, so we're definitely more on the conservation side. Right. Um, and uh, so just affirming, affirming that we're all, you know, working toward the same goal of climate mitigation, climate adaptation, a little more livable society. Um, and that we also, one of the other reasons I invited you is that I have been perceiving in, the, in recent years uh, a potential conflict that I think we need to get in front of between trees and solar power generation. Um, I think Jay, at, at one of the last meetings, Jay is an arborist who happens to work at Smith College, but is, um, has uh, arborist colleagues, and one of them said that 50% um, of his business lately is taking down trees to prepare for solar installation. So this is, um, this is real, and then of course I shared with you also um, a draft ordinance with the city of Greenfield. It's got, it's, actually, I checked in with Molly, who sent it to me, and it's, it's still in process. This is not an ordinance that has been passed, but some of the language in the ordinance related to trees said that no public tree shall be planted which um, shall interfere with uh, solar arrays, um, either existing or proposed. And that felt like strong, very strong language and had a lot of implications about um, what, you know, what the limitations of our of tree planting could become if if um, solar installation becomes really widespread. Uh, so I, I wanted to just open this conversation up and make sure that we all are, um, you know, having just proactive in thinking about it, so we can avoid conflict as much as possible. Do you have an idea of how you want to come at this? Kind of a big picture going down to a narrower picture, or? I'm always in favor of that kind of thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so, so big picture, um, well, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll state right out that I, I see you know, vast benefits in trees as well as in solar. So um, I don't think there's a slam dunk either direction um, uh, here. Um, so I think it's going to be a kind of a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, you know, partly to prove my point, or and, and actually to put something possibly on, on your guys' agenda, um, I will say that when the city went through zoning uh, updates over the last couple of years, one of the things they were looking at is putting and making PV by right in different places. And one of the places where PV is by right, large scale ground mounted PV arrays. So these are big, big arrays are by by right in rural residential and suburban residential uh, areas. And when I saw that, and I said, oh, look, look at the map. There's places where people could take down forests in order to put in PV arrays. And I said, I don't want anybody ever to do that. So um, it was kind of like just pulling a number. Uh, Wayne, kind of, Wayne, planning director, uh, recommended that we just grab this number because we didn't have any better way of saying it. But in zoning right now, it says um, 
that as long as uh, you know you can it's a buy right for large scale ground mounted PV arrays uh, in those two zoning districts, as long as they do not require the removal of more than 25,000 board feet of timber. Well, I actually don't, can't even picture what 25,000 board feet of timber is myself. Jay, um, how many boards do you get out of a tree? <laughs> I'm not on that end. Yeah, so, so my, my, my point is, for me, it was a placeholder. At least there was something in zoning that said trees have an inherent value and that we're not going to start taking down forests or put PV rays in there. What I would like to have, um, and I never had time to follow up on it, is to kind of understand, perhaps from just a carbon neutral point of view, you know, how many trees can you remove before you are degrading your ability to to lower carbon emissions for the PV array. Right. Um, and in, in a more general sense, um, what I picture is that if someone comes in and you have land that has some scrub brush, maybe an occasional small tree, scrub, scrub planting, it's kind of it's growing back into, it was, it was a field that's growing back into a, a forest of some kind, and they want to put a PV array in there, I could see the city supporting that. But if someone wants to come in and clear uh, you know, a forest or a part of their parcel uh, a forest land in order to put a PV array in. I would hope the city would have something pretty strong in their zoning and say that's not allowed. So exactly how do you define that? 25,000 square, uh, you know, 25,000 board feet of timber? That's a number pulled out of a hat. Um, I don't know exactly how that stands. So I'll put that just, you know, highlight for you both the, the fact that the city already considers trees valuable um, and now we will continue to do so. And that, um, you know, in, in, in instead of just doing nothing, and just saying this as a right in these, uh, in these areas, we put something in. And that, that something really should be verified. And I don't know if this co commission could help out with it um, or not, but I'll put it out I there. I see. And so this placeholder of 25,000 board feet of timber, can you remind me again, what is, the, what is that in, in what doc, in what? Is that it's a zoning a, regulation? Yeah, it's and has zone. that already been passed? Yes. It's an existing zoning regulation. Yes. So maybe we need to and can you maybe you can send me the link to yeah. which one that refers mm -hmm. to? Because Chris, what's what's the range and size of PV arrays? Are we is there a, a big They can get there is no uh, necessarily top limit. I mean we're gonna be putting in a I mean, these, oh. are, these are big fields. It's not like somebody just wants a couple on their house. This is, right. this, these are the big fields that are... Right. Okay. This is a large, uh, large scale ground mounted PBRA. Mm -hmm. For more of the residential size ones, or perhaps a, like a Smith vocational, right now we have a, a 106 kilowatt array. Mm -hmm. It was put on an old tennis court. Um, uh, you know, there's, you're going to see some occasional ones that are on that size. For the most part, that's going to be too small for any kind of large developer to want to deal with. Too big for a homeowner. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're probably going to have those on a, on an ad hoc basis. Other than that, you're going to have um, homeowners wanting to put PV arrays in, um, and you're probably going to want large developers who are going to be very large arrays in. It's probably what you would probably see out there. Um, for a homeowner, there are um, places where ground-mounted PV is allowed by right. I know over driveways, they're allowed by right. Um, but you might want to look into zoning and just kind of see where it is. And our zoning, you mean, or yeah, zoning? Yeah, our, our zone. I don't. I mean, we've already looked through all of our ordinances, and I don't remember that coming up. Yeah, yeah. I don't think for the for ground for ground on its own at residential level, re residential size, there's no mention of trees. So I don't know exactly how they would affect that. And what you're seeing, I'm sure, is are um, you know people putting in an array and they have one tree that's in the way that's what i suspect you're seeing out there have you has that come across your desk yet rich or the dpw at all about no uh, the removal of a public shade tree in order to put in no. on yeah, well there it's was inevitable. turkey hill road <laughs> yeah but that that was yes you're correct it was turkey hill road but it was uh, done uh, inappropriately yeah but yes, in other words, it was a public shade tree, and it's not the case where Miami rocks cut it down. And we know yeah. that that happened in Amherst, because remember yeah. that. Yes, it did happen in Amherst. So that's the only case. There has been uh, the residents of Seven Adair Place, for example, um, would like to plant trees on the street to mitigate some of the loss of that other tree, but they don't want to plant any trees on large trees on Prospect Street, uh, because that is where their apparently their solar array is going to go, is on the side of the, their house. Um, so there's an example of a piece of property being built where if we decided to plant a large public shade tree, which we really can't do because you have silly wires, 
where there would be a conflict on our vision versus what their vision is. Right. I had somebody approach me the other night on this very issue. They have a, they have a Norway maple, it's a public shade tree yeah. that is going to become too big. They already have solar. They want to remove that tree and put in other ones or pay for other ones. And so uh, it's it's a street that's um, off of Jackson Street, where those streets on the left. No. Um, what's the name? You go, you go right before Jackson Street School. Baron? If you're coming for, uh, from from uh, oh on uh, on the school is it, side. It, yeah, uh, it's on the left hand side. Yeah. If you're coming from Charles Park. Just before mm -hmm. Jackson Street School, yeah. there's a little neighborhood. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 I mean, this is definitely uh, coming down the road. Then. But there's no need to do anything because the ordinance clearly protects public changers. Period. Full stop. Doesn't matter why. It's true. But if the planning board has it in there, then that, well, well for a roof, but for a residential rooftop solar, it, it doesn't matter. The, yeah. And but. You know, Chris is right. The, really, the only thing <coughs> influencing where solar gets developed now outside of zoning is the SRAC value. And the SRAC value is higher on brownfields, which is why you're not seeing a whole lot of trees getting cut down. But if the state changes that in any way, then more greenfield solar could be proposed. Yeah, I understand in, Sh in Shrewsbury there was proposed, I'm not sure if it's uh, been. I, I thought at one point it was removed, and, and now it's. I, I've heard again recently that it's back. Well, I might be wrong, but Coles Lumber wanted to put in a large PBRA on forest land, <coughs> and that just I mean, that that, sh that shocks me. That's, you know, mm. To me, that's just it's totally inappropriate to take down a forest or put up a PBRA. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you're you're not helping climate change. <laughs> right, and, and, and but I, I just want to bring it back to a cityscape, which is really more yeah. of our purview because we are a public shade tree commission. Our our purview is more about street trees. Yeah, and you could you could see a death by a thousand cuts if, as you know, homeowners put up arrays, and and then you know there are fewer and fewer places where we feel comfortable planting new trees. Let's say. A homeowner puts up an array that doesn't where and they have a tree belt that cur currently doesn't have a tree but we'd like to plant one there and then we feel a little bit like you know we can't we can't really plant one there because they invested in this pv array i mean right now there's the, the numbers are so few that you know we could say i oh, will let this one pass but as more and more arrays come on people's houses the public benefit of having street trees is going to be compromised because it's not, it's not just about the energy it saves, it's also the quality of life of walking down the street, it's the, it's the air cleaning, it's, you know, it's all these other benefits that, um, that don't seem as, as cut and dry as energy production or energy savings. Just, would, would this fit more in, in, a, in a discussion with planning? I mean, it strikes me that this is more like how do you want yeah. Northampton to develop? Um, you see a potential conflict, and maybe it should go through a planning discussion process of some kind. I think that would make sense. I, mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just, if there's a place to plant a tree in the public right away, I'm going to plant it. Whether it's a PD array or not, I hate to be kind of crass, but okay. it, it, well, it's the, 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 the PD array, in my opinion, on, on a person's house is benefiting them. The tree that is in the street mm -hmm. is benefiting the 30,000 residents that live here. So that's that's how I look at it, and you can call me a, a little uh, I don't know what you can call me, but you can just say that I'm a little difficult to deal with. But but also, Chris and I had a really good discussion yesterday about the different parking lots we went to, and we kind of threw a lot of things around. And so I learned a lot about what Chris was, where Chris was coming from. I think Chris kind of learned a lot from where I was coming from. And you know, we talked about putting a PV array like a Ryan Road School because there's virtually no, there really are no trees there. It's four, four, four small ones. Four very yeah. small trees, but there are many other places in Bryan Road in the field area that could actually benefit from nice large shade trees, mm -hmm. and the PV array would actually be serve a shade purpose in the parking lot, mm -hmm. but also generate electricity. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there's a lot of different ways to make this to make those types of larger arrays work, but I think the struggle would be to try to convince people that cutting down like all the trees at JFK parking lot are, are the, a lot of them to make a PV array would be beneficial without doing mitigation planting somewhere yeah. else on the property. Mm -hmm. right. 
So, um, Rich, I do want to respond to the idea of planting a tree that might grow up and shade some of those PV array. Yes. Um, uh, you made the argument that the PV array is benefiting only them, and yet PV arrays by state law get um, produce a be produce a societal benefit. That's why they can sell SREX. So, so PV array is providing a general societal benefit. You know, these so bias. Gotcha. Right. Right. So, and for someone to invest, you know, large amounts of money in the PV array, and then have that investment cut off by a tree. Right. Right. You know, there's, yeah, there, yeah, that's right, there could be taken. I mean, that, I think there's, this isn't a black and white issue in any one no, case. Not. You'll have to be no, looking at it. No, it's not. I think that having a conversation yeah. with a homeowner, obviously, before we do something like that, would obviously be, would be beneficial. Does a homeowner generally pull a permit before they um, can put on solar arrays? If they do, I would never see it. You don't see you don't no. see it because I'm just wondering if at that point we have a conversation we go to the site look at whether they have a tree belt whether you know a tree is either there or could be there and have a conversation about the potential for a tree blocking their arrays I you know not to discourage them because that's not my aim but um, I. You know, my inclination is, is more of Rich's way, but I know that the answer is not to just sink our heels in the sand and no. and not have a com public conversation, because I think that'll just polarize people. Two, two points, one question. So uh, do you have any sense of, um, based on after Solarize Northampton went, went through and kind of, you know, at the peak of the solar mine, do you have any sense of the percent of the capacity of rooftop residential solar in Northampton has been taken up? I don't. Okay. I, don't I suspect it's high. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't have the information to even kind of hazard a okay. guess. Right. I mean, first of all, you have to have uh, uh, roofs that are sloped in the right direction. Yeah. And right. then you have so, to yeah. have uh, roofs that aren't, well, you know, the, the age of the roof, you don't want to put an array on an old roof. So when someone re-roofs the house, then they might look at it because that's actually a natural time to do it. If it has, um, you know, any slate roof, it's probably off limits. You're not going to put, uh, so what, what kind of roof it is uh, might matter. The structural ability of the building to hold a PV array will, will take it into account. And then existing trees. Um, I know there are homeowners out there that look at it and say, okay, I can put it in a PV array, but I have to take out that maple. Yeah. I love that maple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And then they have this own personal, they're going through this same discussion in their family. It's, uh, you know, do we put it in the PV array or do we take out the maple tree? Oh my goodness, what do we do? Yeah. Uh, maybe we put it in a ground mount, you know, move it over here so it's on a ground mount back here. Um, so I think uh, in individual cases, particularly if you're having a conversation, there may be I don't know if everybody will be amenable to it, but I think in both cases you could possibly move the PV array, say, to a ground mount, or you guys could look at planting uh, public shade trees just off enough that you know there's a window for sun to come in for that one house right there. Um, you know, there's. I mean, I think there's going to be adjustments that could be made. Um, but yeah, well, there my, is my point, just to finish up on the question, though, I think as the solar market matures and more community solar comes online, uh, I, I don't, I don't necessarily foresee like this yeah. Yeah. crisis coming down the pipe. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, we it's been generally it's been a nice back and forth so far, and I don't necessarily foresee a crisis. And I and, and then just to put out there, although it is the Public Shade Tree Commission, I do think there's room for you know, smaller species on the streetscape that are not going to, you know, become 40-foot trees. That's what I was going to say, too, is that if it is an issue, we can do smaller trees that will probably get 20, 25 feet maximum height. There you go. And you're not, and also, even with some of the larger ones, you know, it might be, you know, 40 years before they reach their, you know, full right. potential. So by that point, the solar installation is, is long gone, yeah. you know, or at least replaced with something else. So. I think I think the conversation is, is the, the duration that's going to take for something to get so large that it's going to shade it out, and also maybe the possibility exists for a nice, good tree that could reach its full height, its full potential, and never be a problem for the homeowner in any conceivable scenario. But I do want to get back to one point. So, 2,500 or 25,000 board feet is about 10,000 two by fours, or enough to build like one and a half houses. So. That's yeah, it's, it's fairly large, perhaps larger. Than, so how many trees would that be? No, I didn't go that <laughs> 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 Come on, Andrew. Right, that's what I'm trying to picture, you know. <laughs> you could build it. 
if that's five large trees, well, then that, that's you know fairly protective. Um, not completely protective, but fairly protective. Uh, yeah, that is. But if that's you know, if that's fifty trees. large yeah. trees, and <laughs> that's probably not protective enough, right? Um, uh, to to your point, I um, uh, I will say, and then actually to talk what you're saying too, I I don't think solar is going to boom. Um, I think it's going to continue to progress. Um, end of 2016, unless the feds change their mind, the federal tax credit's going to disappear. Um, for residential, it's going to diminish for large scale from 30% tax credit to a 10% tax credit for a large scale raise. For homeowners, it's going to go away completely. So all of a sudden, you're going to have um, a cost benefit that um, homeowners take is going to just drop away um, uh, beginning in, in 2017. So that right there is going to kind of scale back a bit of who's going to be putting PV array in unless something else takes over the uh, place. Um, the price has been coming down. Um, I expect it will continue to come down, but I don't think it's going to um, you know, just plummet at any time. So I think you, 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 you may be foreseeing a problem that might not develop quite that fast. Um, and I'll give an example. My house, I have solar hot water and I have solar um, and I have photovoltaics. And I have two really wonderful apple trees right on the south side that will never get tall enough to shade them. But boy, did they shade my big south facing windows in the mm -hmm. winter, and boy, did they let the sun shine in. I mean, all the way around, shade yeah. them in the, in the summer and let the sun shine in in the winter. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful, wonderful situation for me. I feel like I'm living in a tree canopy um, during the, the summer, and I feel like I've got the sun just coming in and helping my eat my house in the winter. So. There are ways of putting in trees that are designed to work well with solar, solar panels. But I think conversely, the conversation could be, you know, if somebody has to take a tree down, like say they have to take like a big silver maple down, part of the mitigation could be, you know, like multiple small trees. Well, not small, not, not, not like dogwoods. Like, no, <laughs> nice, a nice tree, you know, like, and, 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 like, you know, like oh, I'm oh. a fan of the hornbeam, you know, mm -hmm. hornbeam is a great tree for that application, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, that, that could be part of the conversation. So they get something, but what does everybody else get at the same time? Right. Yeah, I would really encourage that kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. I think you know, taking trees, you know, bring them down a lower height, particularly if they can be very wide and still provide shade. Um, I think would be a very nice compromise. Yeah, my apple trees do it. <laughs> well, they probably don't provide as much shade as the big huge maples, but yeah. uh, in the early morning and the evening. But. Do you so? And in your work where you, you are um, always surveying grant opportunities for the city to do um, energy, you know, sustainability and energy work. Do you see anything related to trees come across your desk? No. Nope, it doesn't seem to be on anybody's radar screen. I mean, the idea of planting, um, you know, a hedgerow along the northern boundary of your property so that you can reduce winter wind or, um, you know, Shade trees to the east and west. That's the time when you get the most, you know, solar gain from that early morning sun, or particularly the late afternoon sun, blasting in the windows. So if you can shade that, it can really be a benefit to, to reduce summer air conditioning needs. Um, no, nope, it's out there. I mean, people know about it, but no one is really actively pursuing that in any way. Okay. Any other questions from other folks? Tom, you were saying that um, the. I just want to backtrack. You said that um, commercial. You mean you mean that um, there's going to be commer more co more chance for consumers to buy their electric through a solar array that like a farm, solar farm, that's, or whatever. That's not on their property. Yep. That correct. Okay. That's, that's. Now it would just be coming to the. P. S. That's one of the large scale. Yeah. Well, So um, I don't know how much questions time. for us. Well, I just wanted to because it, it because it is a kind of a um, opportune time. Um, I did send you the feasibility analysis done of a bunch of parking lots. Um, you're welcome to share that with the you know, committee. Um, I did uh, talk with Rich and yesterday. We went and looked at um, four of the sites because uh, I was. We are currently looking at putting PV array at the fire headquarters parking lot 
and at Smith Vocational. Both of them are grants um, supported to some, actually, they're both connected with grant supported projects. The PV arrays would have to be third party owned uh, procurements um, that we do. So they're kind of a separate procurement. Um, but while we're doing that, knowing that we can probably generate a better value to the city if we actually had a larger arrays to attract developers, we decided to look to, you know, are there any other city street uh, parking lots that would, that would work? Um, so I would like to identify come a couple of the the top priority, you know, you know the, the easiest to do parking lots to toss into this um, project, so that we do those two parking lots and maybe one, maybe two, maybe three others um, uh, as well. Um, and uh, so looking at that, I, looking at the reports that I had, I did. You, uh, Lily, you will see kind of a, a table like this, which kind of identifies for me. I, I looked at each one of them and identified which ones have problems with um, snow removal because of uh, canopies, which ones would have to remove small trees, which for medium trees, which for large trees, and were there any other things. And that, looking, you know, breaking that down, I was able to identify the ones that would probably provide a decent size array without too much hassle. And um, two of them I included. Uh, the high school and the middle school um, because they were actually provide fairly large arrays but uh, in driving around with Rich yesterday I feel like it would really be difficult to put those in because of the tree removal that would be that that would be problematic um, I think it would really delay things quite frankly maybe the city would want to look at it in the future at some point um, but this would be a commission that you'd have to talk through with you know it's uh, there's, there's a trade-off. There's quite a few trees in both those cases. The high school has a very, very large old pine tree. Um, uh, that this is in their parking lot? It's not in their parking lot. It's actually probably in the public right away. I see. Right, so. <laughs> so those two kind of got written off the side. The two other ones we looked at actually looked at like looked like they might be viable, so just for an example. So Ryan Road, four tiny trees that are actually being kind of choked by you know where they're planted right now. If they were removed and the project then planted small, four small trees in a place where they could really grow big um, in Ryan Road school area, and there's, there's some spots there, that would be a nice, that could be a nice trade-off. So Ryan Road could be a good, good location. How are the, the racks going to be? The racks, um, that's going to partly depend on the need for snow plowing and what kind of equipment would have to get underneath them. Um, racks out there um, are often can be on a 14 feet high. Uh, the designer that looked at this was talking about, in some cases, racks of about 18 feet high. And, um, and you know, that might be a conversation that the town has to, the city has to have too. Just would we want to have canopies of that height in some of our parking lots? Um, so, um, well, I think of JFK, how the parking lot is in front of the school, so you'd be completely blocking the school. No, we're looking. We were looking. looking at there's a parking lot that oh, has the kind side of a, one. Oh, yeah, okay. there's, there's a okay. long side one, and then there's a arched one in the back. Yeah, and the long side one has lots of trees along there, and the arched one in the back um, that it has lots of trees in there too. And they're decent trees. They look like they're not that old. They're healthy. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, quite frankly, for me, because I want this project to move along fairly quickly, I'm not. I'm looking for which parking lots would be easy to move forward quickly. Um, what so about that big vacant lot on King Street? Is that? Oh, that's private. That's private, right? That's private. Yeah, right. So the other one we're looking at is what I call the Old South Street lot, which is here down on Old South Street with Hampton Ave mm -hmm. on it. And there's a number of there's some spots along there that would work. Um, uh, Rich tells me that the trees. Uh, the southern um, section of that lot have got a bunch of small trees that Rich tells me are really quite unhealthy and probably have to come out within a year. Anyhow? Yeah, that's all the sycamores. Oh, yeah. Those all the parking lot. Oh, maple wood. Yeah. Yeah. Maple yeah. wood shop. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, that's yeah. what you yeah. down old, old South Street parking lot. Okay, yeah, I just. Okay. Yeah. And, then, and then there's a couple of, then there's a couple of larger trees um, in the old Mill River bed that are kind of right next to it. That are also are not in the greatest shape. At least some of them are not in the great, that great a shape. That would probably have to be removed to make it viable. So, um, uh, and then on the Hampton Avenue side, there are trees along Hampton Avenue that 
if we were to if we were to put canopies in right underneath them, they would have to be trimmed. Um, These are the uh, the pin oaks that are already underneath uh, flyers. Uh, those are locusts. Yeah, they're they're mostly locusts, right? Mostly I think locusts. there was I think there was one, I think there was one oak there when we looked yeah. yesterday, but yeah, there's any to eat there. They're the ones that have really uprooted the sidewalk. Sidewalk. Yeah. And uh, the uh, curving there. Mm -hmm. Right. And Richie was saying yesterday that those probably are far older than they would ever expect it to be. They were expected to, they were probably planted, there was a plan to be there for about 20 years and they've been there for 30, 30 years. Right over here on Hanson Avenue, yeah, right good. across from where the brewery is. Right. That whole row of trees right there. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I guess I'm still like, kind of confused, like, because I've seen some plans where people would just kind of omit panels in an area where shading would be a problem if they can't get permission from the budding property owner to, to take a tree down. Like, I, I just reviewed one the other day where there's like this giant, like, U shape in the project, and I was like, "Why is that U shape there?" And like, "Well, we couldn't get permission to take a tree right. down, so we just kind of moved everything over this way." So, I mean, has the shading analysis been done to determine that they have to come down, or that there's no way to like shift the shift the footprint? Or anything? Here, um, actually, um, Lily, I want to say, as chair, you want to spend more time on this with your agenda? Um, well, if it's time sensitive, what what, I, what we have next is yeah, because we are we are um, twenty ten minutes out of out of time now. Um, so I'm going to just ask Rob and Jen, we are going to debrief fall plantings. Um, the online survey thing, I think we could, we could bump that to, um, uh, let's spend five more minutes. Okay. I, I would say no more than five minutes. Okay. Um, Rich, you don't happen to have your color copy, do you? Yeah. Which, which one is that? <laughs> this would be the South, what I call the South Street lot. Um, but here you can see, uh, color copy is much easier to show. So here's where he's recommending um, the ones. I can see these kind of rectangular ones. Yeah, the, these areas where he's recommending the arrays. So any one of these arrays, you know, you could drop. Um, these are the, the trees that we were just talking about, the ones that are in bad health. This is the area where there's some larger ones, some of them are in bad health. These are the ones that would have to be trimmed in order to have this array go in. So, um, uh, I wish I had a way of displaying this up so mm -hmm. everybody could be seeing this. Yeah. Um, or you can pass it around. Please. Yeah, I could pass it around. So gonna, what stage are you in this project, Chris? Um, we have, we, we're, let, let, me, let me give an overview here okay. first, okay? Right. So the, the trees that are kind of unhealthy are down in here, down this, this southern, southern area down here. Yeah. Um, the larger trees, some of them are unhealthier, right in this little spot right over here. Um, the trees that had to be trimmed along Hampton Avenue were right here. And if you don't trim them, then you just wouldn't include this array. So the, the project would just get a bit smaller. Um, but with that, I will pass it around. The red are areas where the um, engineer said, no, nope, you can't put any array in. Um, so kind of, the kind of purple and rectangulars are where they're just putting the canopies in and the circles are, and ovals are where they are talking about trees. Did you guys look at the top of the parking garage? We did, yeah, and I could go into that. Um, that's still, we, we would have to, real quickly, we would have to have a structural analysis done, um, and I am considering how the city might want to pay for that. Uh, and if it says it can't hold it, then we wouldn't put it up there. Um, is the, you have to, you know, it's a building, so you have to say it's a building strong enough to hold it right. And the way you would naturally design it, the, the snow would shed off the side of the building. That's a big drop, mm -hmm. you know, big snow coming down and a big drop. So um, uh, would the city, the city have to have a conversation of how do you block that area so that no one could be there in the winter when the snow comes pouring off? It could be, a, it could be. So those are two issues there. We did look at the parking garage, it would be a, a is what I would actually like to have done, but still the two things. So, Chris, you know, given given that, that we're running a little short on time yeah. here, is there is there an opportunity that we could have uh, again to yes. consider this? Yes. This isn't going to move. Timeline? The timeline is um, uh, we're we're actually trying to work through how to do the procurement for this. Uh, once we have that set, it's going to take a little bit of time to get an RFP together. Um, and it could be that you just, you know, plunk a project in or take it out of the RFP. Um, uh, so over the next month or two, I would hope to have an RFP out. Um, we don't want to delay too much because 
um, because of that tax credit going away at the end of um, uh, 2016. It's a it's altogether it's a complicated project because it also involves two other complicated projects that have grants. One of them, which we don't have a contract for yet, so um, they're all kind of trying to tie together. Okay, so just to summarize, your most promising site is Ryan Road Elementary School. Yeah. That, okay. And your um, the second one would be your the Maplewood Shopping Center. Yeah, yeah, that's what you call it, right? Um, and and quite frankly, Strong uh, the parking lot on Strong Avenue is also one to consider uh, for us, but there's no trees there, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay. That's more. All right. You know how do we shed? Snow? And so, so you are you are taking the high school and the and the middle school off the table? I am because I can't see getting through a decision making process. Okay. You know, a good a good decision making process for the city fast enough for those. Okay. Yeah. Are there? Are there? Mm -hmm. In my mind, I'm taking it off. All right. I, mean, I don't know how other people feel. Well, I mean, you know, my hesitation with the maple wood is that yes, the trees are all in decline there. They're all terrible trees. But are we are we are we making a decision very hastily to go from trees to no trees permanently? You know, and what what are the implications of that? Because I mean, we could also be looking at replacing those trees with other trees. Sycamores aren't going to do well there. I think the planting site is too narrow. I don't think any trees. So you, well. I agree with you. There's not enough rooting volume in those in the, in the islands that they left to support right. a tree. There's not enough. There's I thought it was less. Soil. I thought it was less that issue and more that there are actual pavers in there that are that are girdling the trees. And if you look at that, if you look at the base of those trees, they are being strangled. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if it's. You guys know more about this than I. But, but it's just a question asked because when you put up a solar array, it's, it's permanent. We're not. Well, it's 20 years. Yeah. Well, okay. So, it, I mean, at the same time, it's like, okay, 20 years, right? You know, plant some trees, you know, 20 years from now, yeah. they'll be okay. You know, so they yeah. come down. I mean, the cost, I mean, everybody wants to cut it down, leave the stump, and walk away. You know, and I really think it would be responsible if you're going to take them down. Take out the stumps and then do you know replacement planting if that's the best scenario and they're bad trees. I mean, where you can replace a tree because I mean, nobody wants to have a hot parking lot in the middle of your town just kind of like you know creating heat, you know, just like yeah. heat island and, and all of a sudden it's like an inhospitable hot parking lot with no shade, nobody wants to be there. But it's like intangibles, you know, right? The canopies provide shade, um, so that's that. But the solar, the solar, solar, solar yeah. panels yeah. provide shade, right? Yeah. But they, they what, is that, what are the aesthetics? <laughs> um, look up canopies online. Yeah. Um, see. It's just cool because that, that's it's really, really in town. Um, REI in uh, Framingham has got um, uh, a large set of canopies up um, right now. You can go online and see that. You can drive out to Framingham. You go up to Greenfield. I don't know exactly how to direct you to it, but there is one small apartment complex that has a PV array on a canopy um, over their parking lot. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like going to the REI parking lot in front of him because in the summer, you know you're going to be parking in, in the shade. In the yeah. shade. Yeah. And you can even stand around there and you know kind of take a deep breath yeah. from it. The city of Oakland School District, I have a friend who works out there, they have um, solar arrays like this on every single one of their school parking lots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you don't have small well, snow, you just it's right. really, it's it's a really ball easy. Game. Yeah, it's a different right. ballgame. Yeah. 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 Has yeah. anybody seen any reports on how trees and solar can solar panels can coexist? I mean, it it's, it seems like a good problem to have. Um, right. And I'm just wondering, has anybody done any assessments or reports or anything? On the north side, I think, of course. Right. <laughs> the north side or <laughs> below the shade line. As, right? as I understand, partial shading somehow destroys the, the efficiency. Is that? Yeah. For photovoltaic, for solar hot water, you can have some kind of web right. shading, no problem. Mm -hmm. But fo photovoltaics, as soon as you have a shade line across a cell, yeah. that turns that piece of that cell into a resistor. Uh -huh. And the electrons trying to flow through this. Uh -huh. So, so it prevents the whole panel or the whole array of panels? It, it'll prevent that cell, if that cell is connected up with a bunch of other cells, then that string of cells, if that string of cells, um, uh, make, you know, making a module is connected with a bunch of other modules, yeah. then a bunch of modules. That's why they have what they call microinverters, where 
the inverter is on the back of each panel. So can, in my house, I have them. So each each individual's module has its own inverter. So if you shade one cell of a module, right. it only gets rid of that one module. Okay. Right. So, but if you have them all, the, all the uh, you know the, the large arrays all have the, the modules all strung together, right. and then one cell would knock out that entire array. Right. right. So. All right. Christmas tree lights wired in a series. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I I'm gonna have to uh, yep. unfortunately move us along on our agenda, but I will um, take the email that you just sent me with the with the attachments that include a lot of this stuff forward to everybody and. Um, and we're going to meet another two weeks. Okay, great. So we, um, I can definitely put that on the agenda as a, as a discussion. Okay. Okay. And um, if you, if anybody does go down to Old South Street or what I call Old South Street, um, uh, to look it over, yep. uh, look at where would you move trees to? I mean, mm -hmm. because part of the project could say to the developer, if you're taking down these trees, you have to, you know, put a new one in yeah. place. Okay. Thanks very much for coming, Chris. Yeah, thanks. Welcome. This was great. All right, I apologize for getting us so far off. Let's talk about fall plantings. We did it, we made it through five Saturdays of fall plantings. Rob and Jen, you have the floor. Okay, well, the five plantings. Uh, people, volunteers, and leaders, I think, enjoyed themselves, actually. We had a tendency for people to sign up for more uh, days of volunteering as the project went along, yeah. rather than dropping out. So I'm not sure, there, is, there are one or two people that I'm not sure what happened to. So they may have dropped out, maybe. But certainly many more signed up for more days. We have uh, a lot of potential volunteers, which is actually an issue because it's more than we're organized to use and people are wondering why aren't they being called to volunteer. The limiting factor, I would say, would be the number of leaders. And we were really lucky that uh, the leaders in this room and some other leaders uh, stayed in there and did some extra time. And that made it work. Having a high leader to volunteer ratio, I think, really helps the trees, but it also helps uh, volunteers feel like they're really learning something while they're there. So I think that. If, you know, if Rich concurs, I think we'll be repeating something like, that. we'll be fine tuning. I think everyone, the whole program, and continuing something like it. I think uh, you all got the three reports that Lily sent out as part. So I think Jen and I will sit down and go over them in detail and see what aspects of the report would influence our, our next attempt, which I think will be in the, likely in the spring, depending on what, what Rich is up, but maybe in the fall. Um, it's something, something next year. I have, um, that's pretty much the, the general report. I, I think there are some major changes that will take place, hopefully, possibly. We have very large root balls this time, which I think put a little extra physical strain on people that was not necessarily necessary. Um, we might be changing to grow back trees to change things. Um, that's probably the biggest biggest change that might, might be nature. It turns out that the, the the number of trees that can be planted on a Saturday morning is about 14, just having to do with organization and BPW. And I think that Rich was kind of saying that, and I'm kind of agreeing, but that seemed, to, that seemed to work about right. So we have to think about the scale of the workforce and, and the UPW and how many trees we try and plant. Uh, so right now we have, uh, this is uh, kind of going to the so next thing. What's the limiting factor there, support? Limiting factor is really two things. It's um, identifying sites. sites and then having enough lead time from so this year we did the site tour that we did. The four of us went around with, and that was very helpful because that, you know, helped out in getting locales um, that you know I had not had around. We're really not on my radar screen. I have, most of my radar screen has been designed really around replacing trees where trees have been removed because that's the easiest. It doesn't require a lot of effort on my part, I guess, to go back uh, out to look at places. 
So um, that is one limiting factor. And then the actual getting the dig safes and getting the trench permits all in line to do the work every single week proved to be a challenge. So I really had all the sites staked out and called in on a Monday or a Tuesday at the latest in order to have legal dig safes. The trench permits really are not legal until seven days goes by, but I, because we're part of the, I'm part of the department, I'm able to communicate with the other divisions who have to mark out the water and sewer locales to make sure they're okay. I want to say that that limitation was just built into the fact that we got a late start. I mean, if you had been able to know this winter that we're going to plant next year, well, this is these spaces could be identified. Um, well, the, but and the, the, the problem with that, I ran into this, is that the dig safe tickets are only good for like 30 days? Well, well it wouldn't be dig safe, but Rich would have a list of, of, of the species yeah. that we were going to acquire instead of where they were going to go. Yeah, instead of creating instead of creating spaces like as I'm going, yeah. I would have a whole list of spaces mm -hmm. that I would already have scoped out. Mm -hmm. So then I just got to put the stake out there, well, and, then, and then we're done with yeah. it. Yeah, and part of our tree inventory, hopefully, is identifying right. up to Correct. thousand spots. And so that that, that would be benefit. That's going to be a huge benefit because that would. I would be able to take the information right out, out of the table yeah. and say that we're going to plant X, Y, and Z tree in X, Y, and Z location right. because this is what came through the survey. So what's going to ha happen here is that the tr tree belts, which is where many of the trees that went in of these 80 trees and tree belts, um, are, are relatively easy to, to cite and that all that you have to do is decide to put a tree there and you put a stake and then you put a tree. Mm. But in, in a lot of neighborhoods, there are no tree belts. Yeah. And so getting, and this is Andrews Street. Uh, you know, Andrews Street has yeah. almost no tree. There's, there's almost no trees on this street. So to get, a, to plant trees there, uh, you have to go door to door. First, we have to have a flyer so everyone is notified. That's something to talk about. And then you have to go door, door to door. I think it's really an important part of this because if we don't, uh, go door to door, somebody go door to door and, and develop these setback site plantings. There are a lot of streets, especially with smaller lot sizes, smaller houses, that won't have any trees at all. And so it, there's just sort of an equity issue um, and an aesthetic issue of just leaving all these barren streets. And I'm already beginning to work on that. I mean, I, I've been knocking on doors today. I, uh, you know, I look at, I can never tell whether it's Northern Ave or Northern Street, but the one that got rebuilt. North, North, Street. Street. North, North Street. Street. North Street. North Street. Mm -hmm. You know, I've walked up and down North Street several times in the last couple of days. You know, people probably will never call me back. Yeah, it's very time consuming. Right. And, <laughs> and, the, and the return rate right. is very, very low. I've, I've done yeah. the same thing. Exactly. But, but but I think it has to be done. And I've, um, oh. I've, I'm trying to recruit now. So, you know, it's part of volunteer effort people who are going to go out and do that. Um, yeah, make sure they're, they're, you know, really diplomatic ambassadors because we, you know, right. we want to have the right tone set. So I've got some wonderful, I've got my eyes on some people who yeah. really, um, really. Well, it, this is the one thing, so you know, the city of Amherst, or town of Amherst undertook to plant 2,000 trees and they, and they bonded a huge amount of money to do it. But in, in so doing, or in reflecting upon it, Alan Snow, the tree warden, realized that he did not budget enough money for the time it takes to, to identify because all the, you know they have they have picked all the low hanging fruit and yeah. now they are mm -hmm. at that setback planning stage and it is just majorly time consuming Terrible. so one piece of advice he had for us was you know like factor in a lot more time for that piece I, uh, you know, so that really, I mean, I think it's great that you're doing it, uh, you know, as, a, as your own separate volunteer thing, but I think that once we integrate that into a larger plan of retraining the city, we're going to need to put a, uh, you know, a price. Well, well I, I'm interested in, um, when I f find volunteers um, during this winter, two things. One, I'd like either the committee or Rich to kind of have a big input into how we're going to do that. I want it to be a regular program. I want literature printed yeah. and sent out so people mm -hmm. know this is happening. People have like little cards that they can say, you know, I'm a volunteer with the for, for the DPO or for the commission of the sure who the volunteer for the city. For the city. Right. Uh, right. So I guess I bring it up because at this commission, I know that it needs to be 
I think for a successful program, it needs to be integrated in so that you know, our general program, so that by May, Rich has a list of all these sites where people have requested trees and they've specified the species so that he can match up the trees he has with the sites, put the stake in the ground. That's pretty quick to do once, once it's all identified. Can I just, yeah. having done that quite a bit in the city of Worcester, ah, yeah. uh, you really need people doing that who are trained in tree species and know right. what tree is going to do good on it. Right. That's a really good point. I mean, I think that it's kind of unlikely that we'll necessarily have, I've been thinking about that, people that can put that much shoe leather into, into it that know all of that, but once they identify someone who wants a tree, then hopefully um, we can bring in people who are more experienced. But wouldn't it, wouldn't it be easier to put the, the onus on the people who have, who are in that situation to come forward and say, I would like a tree set yeah. back, rather yeah, than going out and finding them? I guess it depends on how, sorry, go ahead. I guess, go ahead. What, what we ended up doing is that even after like canvassing, so one of the things that I think the number of people who call back will be small enough that the trained person can deal with those people, you know, maybe like 100, 200 people call back, that's like a good response, you know, right. for 300, that, that's like great um, in a year. Um, having people who are dedicated volunteers who can just go out, knock on doors, say, cities planting trees, set back plantings, uh, you know, you know, here's how you get the information, would you like a tree, yes, no, get their information down, feed it over to Rich, you know, and then, and then that puts it on the list of things to follow up on. And then the other thing is that we, we developed this post-it note thing, basically it just has like the program details and you just kind of stick on people's doors. Yeah. And then they can just follow up and say, free tree. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Rich was thinking of in, maybe in the water bill. Door hangers. Yeah. Yeah. Door, door hangers, uh, yeah. and any kind of mailing that we, the DVW can, who does we can put these kind of things in there. Yeah. Um, not going to cost very much. A single, single, mm -hmm. small flyer says, you know, we are what we're doing. Uh, please contact this number if you're interested in uh, having a tree planted. Or if you want to talk to someone, you know, here you go. I was, and I like the, the other thing too, Rob, is if you're going to do the volunteer thing with the sticky note, no one's there, psh, put it on the door, mm -hmm. and you know, away you go. Like I'll do it with my business card. I'll stick a business card in the door I'll write on the back, but please call me. I was here today, blah, blah, blah. It, it, it is effective. Um, and you don't have to know a lot to, to do that. Too. Right. So right. there's kind of three levels of supervision in terms of the tree, and then there's a, whoever makes contact with them, and then hopefully somebody, but not necessarily rich, who helps pick a tree, because that's a conversation that can go on for actually hours. I want to I want to bring us back to the agenda topic here, okay. which yeah. was a debrief from the fall planning, yes. because I do feel like this is an important topic, but we're off topic. Um, and we're already so behind schedule. So is there anything else about the fall plantings that you guys would like to? So the only thing um, I just want to make sure people are aware of that Robert and I are going to meet and we're going to kind of like put together a report about, you know, details of what we did and then, you know, what, like what we did as a group and then, you know, some kind of recommendations, po positive, negatives. So um, in the interest of time, if people do have positive or negative comments or things you think we should think about or do differently, you could just email Rob and I rather than have a big conversation about it here. Sure. And, um, and we're just going to put down details of you know how many people, because we had a certain number every week of people that didn't show up. Mm -hmm. So that means we need to remember Attrition that and right. pad, our, pad our numbers next mm -hmm. time. Or, you know, and, and, and I think in there we could have a future, you know, what are things we need to look, what what are things for future tree plantings? Yeah. A setback program, you know, planting program, you know, and we can have, yeah. you know, so. Could I just advise you all when you, when you do that to try to structure it as if you were adding pages to a manual? Yeah. Because that's what we're trying to do is we're trying we to build a it program. On Google Docs. Yeah. In Rich's report, you mentioned, Rich, mm -hmm. that 80 have been planted and there's 16 left mm -hmm. for this fall. Yep. Uh, what are the plans for those 16? Well, well Rob, and I are, Rob and I met yesterday uh, about uh, doing different 20. To get those 16 trees planted in the ground shortly, we're going to either we're gonna work with my crew and uh, possibly Smith Folk 
uh, Rob's gone out and helped me out by identifying some places that need to have trees that I concur with, and just because I have my own knowledge. So um, we also had a communication about taking 20 of the 62 trees from Amherst Nursery and actually getting those planted this month as well by using DBW forces, Smith School forces, and also using uh, volunteers possibly uh, during the week where Rob would actually plant some of the trees himself with other volunteers. You can let us know when those dates are set. Well, you're on my list. Oh, good, yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> because they're real like Wednesday or Thursday. Wednesdays and Thursdays. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we like to get, I mean, I would like to say that we planted over 100 trees this fall. I think that would be really awesome. You know, it's kind of getting late in the season. I'm a little worried that the weather can turn very quickly, but supposedly we're supposed to have a, a little uh, milder than normal early winter, so we could be planting trees possibly a few years past mm -hmm. in early December. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And is watering, are we able to water the ones that were? I took all the water, I took the water bags off because of the freezing temperatures at night because it's getting to be 20 degrees at night, the water bags off. So if we need to water them, we will go out there and water them with our, the jet riding vehicle. Okay. So depending upon the, depending upon the weather. <coughs> I'm hoping for some more rain. So because another, we, we, we can figure, right, we can, uh, you know, one of the things we need to, I think we need to figure out is a watering, like, like I could, I live off of South Street. I could take like three or four trees at the end of my street right. and just water those. Right. You well, know? That, that's but why we, we have to figure out a system. Yeah, that's why I have on this list as a bullet point: adopt a tree for new plantings. Right. I have. I had a neighbor ask, "Can I water trees?" And I said, "Yes." And she said, "Can I put a word out on the list?" I said, "Before you do, let's let me just bring this topic to the commission because I I feel like there there is a structure that could be yeah. had. I know that." Um, you know, a friend, a friend of mine whose son just got Eagle Scout, um, created the Adopt a Hydrant program for the DPW. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, where people could go online and click, click a hydrant that they want to adopt and, and um, shovel around it during winter time. Um, and you know, maybe we want to have something as simple as that, or, or you know, we've got it. I just feel like if we're going to look out for the trees and really protect them during that first year, we've got to have. A systematic program and whether it's water back getting water bags back on and knowing that the DPW every week is going to be filling them or having some kind of system for adopted trees we need to be thinking about that I agree. so you guys are filming well you're, you're that, is, that is so good that is such a wonderful thing and I'm really glad that they're doing that what for water bags? oh yeah. yeah that's that's and so a, lot, a lot of folks have filled them for us mm -hmm. but we you know I don't really have a good count Right. You know, that would be very complex to know. It would be complex, but it would be great to also have a door hanger say, Congratulations, you're the proudest owner of a new tree in front of your Can you please water, please water me? Exactly. You know, the picture of tree going, Oh, there's so, yeah. you know, just to get their attention. So, I, I do think we need to be thinking about this. We have about two more minutes to talk about well, fall the, plantings. Just look the, the, the um, fall planning. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Various comments of, of what we think we should be thinking about for next year or what Jen and I should be. Maybe you know, send them. Send yeah, them just email. Yeah, email, yeah, email, email us right. if there's something that worked well or something mm -hmm. that you think could have been better. I think one right. thing I would like to do is I would like to send a thank you to every single volunteer. Mm -hmm. But thank you. Yeah, yeah. That was we did talk about. Oh, the other thing we talked about yeah. was uh, putting a letter to the editor from the Public Trade Street, Public Trade Street, Street mm -hmm. Commission to say thank you to all the volunteers. Yeah, if I could give give me a number of how many people there were. I mean, you, Jen, if you want to draft it, I'm happy to draft it too. Um, it, I would just need the details. Okay. Okay, so why don't you draft it and then uh, we can get you the details when we need. Okay. Because the reality uh, is, I okay. probably can't do both. Do we need the names of people now? No. Okay. I do have, that spreadsheet's pretty good actually, the names, but there are some people who are hard to draft. I feel so bad. Um, I can't that Okay, so additional fall plantings in November. Do we want to decide what kind of effort to put in in terms of with the Vogue School or something? Or are you just going to build this, figure out what, what to do? Could maybe? that be a conversation maybe between yep. the three of you? Mm -hmm. I don't That's know if that needs to be a commission wide conversation. Mm -hmm. Just fine. because mm -hmm. whatever we I'm decide, we'll time. make the commissioners aware of. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that work for Yeah, It's kind of a, it's kind of a uh, difficult moment for the next mm -hmm. For the students, anyways, mm -hmm. yeah. we can probably get them like a week, maybe. Mm -hmm. So. All right.
right. Thank you all. Great, just a great uh, yeah. project. Yeah, right. Volunteer coordination is amazingly difficult it's and frustrating. Awesome. And, and, and I don't know, I, it, it's a real incredible effort that you guys have done already. I don't know if it's sustainable. So we might want to just think about if there are any other partner organizations that we can sync up with to take some of the administrative organizational burden off of the That's commission. A it's a pretty unique yeah. attribute of, um, of a public board mm -hmm. to coordinate volunteers. So um, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what other kind of resources are, are out there that could assist, but I think we do need to kind of think about that mm -hmm. going forward or, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, everyone's going to get exhausted. Well, as long as we have broad yeah. rounds. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to do that. He's amazing. He is. He is. <laughs> and you seem to love it. I love doing it. So, yeah. I mean, I, I have trouble doing all the emails a bit because I get, I'm not sure they're all perfectly organized, but um, I think probably if, if uh, especially sit down with a little help, can make up the emails ahead of time so they're ready to go. I think you did a great job, Rob. Oh, Thank my you. gosh, yeah. They're really good job. I was very impressed with all the details right. you tended to. And, and it, the organization part might not be sustainable, but the, the volunteers returning, I actually might yeah. kind of ask you why you can see in the spring fall. Mm -hmm. We'll see it an ever increasing number of volunteers. So we probably more have to think about it. How to make sure everyone that wants to engage is yeah. well, That's what I meant. But at yeah. some yeah. point, I mean, yeah. it's going to get yeah. too big. Surveys. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, all right. Having to move us along. Sorry about this, folks. All right, so I just wanted to bring up the topic. We do not have to decide this tonight of, of what our 2016 meeting schedule is going to be. We did talk at the last meeting about maintaining a, a twice a month meeting schedule. Whether that's going to be Wednesday at 4 p.m., I don't know if people's schedules are changing. I'm happy to bump that to the next meeting. Be thinking about what your schedule might be like in 2016. Um, and then I, we had mentioned at the last meeting um, that when we first uh, elected me chair, it was uh, for like a six months um, trial period, for lack of a better term. <coughs> And so we've been together six months. Wow. So, um, six months today? Not bad for six months. Yeah. Really? Okay, right? Yeah. Woo! We're up a lot of work in six months. Very yeah. impressive. Yeah. Nice job. Um, so, uh, I, you know, we can be thinking about whether we want to continue me as chair. As I said at the last meeting, I'm happy to continue as chair. Move to extend. <laughs> Second. Call <laughs> should <laughs> All right. I, I, I don't know if there's a conflict with me asking for a vote on this, but um, all right. Uh, is there any objection? I'm uh, totally open to it. I'm also open to, um, you know, I'm, I'm always open to feedback. So. Well, I think, I think just doing it in the first business meeting of every year, just having an election for chair and vice chair. Okay. So you want to make it a January cycle? I, th I think that makes the most sense. Okay. Now, what do people that. think about that? Yeah, because otherwise... Well, I have a question because uh, our, we started in May, and um, the, don't the terms? That's right. The terms will end. I'm just wondering if we want to coincide it with the terms. Oh, oh that, gets, that starts my head spinning. It's like June, June 1st to May 31st, I think. Um, I'd have to. Uh, and, and, yeah, I can't each remember. Group has there are many different lengths of terms. Yeah. How do you yeah. get reappointed, the mayor? I yeah, and I I think that. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean that well, raises the whole there's that raises a whole yeah. bunch of questions like are we are we comfortable with the size of this commission and you know do we want to make any other recommendations to the mayor but um, but yeah the terms are staggered they're one two or three years I know that I'm on the two and I think it was uh, you know so we're we're all somewhere mm. one or one two or three regardless of the term length though it's they're all starting and ending at the on same the time, same right? time uh, but they won't always be. I think that they are for now. But like, for example, if somebody dropped out for any reason, uh, yeah. then they would be reappointed at that at that time. Yeah. So I like I happen to like Andrew's idea of January because it's an easy thing to remember. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Like it's the new year. Mm -hmm. Let's have a vote for. Mm -hmm. So should we just try that and out? Then you have someone. If the terms are up in June, then it's people are voting for a chair and then they're out. Well, I mean, presumably they get reappointed unless they're just. I mean, I would hope that the chair of your commission would get re 
pointed. Right. I mean, that would be yeah, unusual, would say you know. Um, there's, you know, there's no term limits in this commission, um, so it, you know, I, I think that it would be up to the person to anticipate whether or not they want to right. continue. And I think right. it is pretty pro forma that if you want to continue, you just let the mayor know and the mayor. At least this one. Yeah. <laughs> you never know. I've worked in five other ones, so <laughs> everything changes. Yeah, that's true. I think we can work with the change. So, okay, so then let's, in um, January of first meeting, we'll have a vote for chair and vice chair. Until then, I'll continue being chair and Todd will continue being vice chair. Does that Sounds work good. for everybody? Mm -hmm. All right. Trying to catch us back up on schedule and not having a very good time. At it. All right, next agenda item is the online survey. Really, what I just want to do is find someone who's going to lead this project. I need a project. Oh, God, yes. Woo -hoo! I was we were going to say that. What a combination. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, is, there, uh, is everyone comfortable with Marilyn um, spearheading this project? You go. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, because it's a big, wild, and woolly one. There's like 400 Excellent. responses. So I just wanted to right say something about that. Uh, today I was informed by the uh, system treasurer that uh, even though we are still getting billed every month uh, for the survey monkey, so oh, we are. We are. So what yeah. I what okay. she did today is she actually went back in and uh, stopped them from billing us. So we have the ability to view the basic format. Oh, shoot. So if we are not satisfied with what the information garnered from that basic format or that basic uh, spreadsheet then I can have her reopen the account, but I'll go on that and keep billing us every month. Yes. Even though we're not, even even though no one is using the survey monkey anymore. All well, I have to do is go in and, and download PDFs of the, the or data. CSVs. Okay. All right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What is it, CSV? Uh, CSV is uh, uh, comma separated value. Thank you. <laughs> Beat me to it. <laughs> So, so, so if there's anything, if there's any issues with that, just okay. please let me know and I'll work there to get it turned back. Right. Right. You know the data though? No. I have no. a comment about the survey monkey. I, the only thing is, is it's a searchable database whilst yeah. it's on the survey monkey site, whereas once you download the, the whatever PDFs or whatever they're CSVs. CSVs. I don't think it's a searchable database. Well, any, any CSV is searchable in the same, I mean, it's, it's like an Excel spreadsheet. You can search by any keyword. Or, I agree okay. that it may have more, it, it may have more strengths. Yeah, it so has cool strengths the way you can get percentage. You, it, it, it developed a bunch of information. Yeah, what I'm hoping to download is actually like, you can you can do graphs and charts and things based on okay. the Are you pretty good with spreadsheets? Yeah. Okay, then, then, then why don't you go, you, you have the information to get on, right? Did I give you the, like, the, the username and the pass? Uh, it's probably somewhere in okay, my I'll folder. Write it, I'll write it for you. Okay. And then um, why don't you go on now and see if what you can do with it, and if it's not enough, then I think we should extend it one more month. One it's more not that much money. It's like 25 bucks, and I think it'll be worth a while. But it means that you've got like a month to... Get everything you want. Okay. So I was able to go on and just ask for people who had volunteered to work, for instance. Yeah. And, they, and you got up. I got 87 of those. Which you should be able to do when you've downloaded it into a spreadsheet. So, um, Marilyn, I'm going to yeah. give you all of the hard copies. Okay. Oh, wow. Oh, cool. That made it came back. Yeah. Wait, that's four, 400. We had 400. References. So. Uh, that doesn't look like foreign people. Those are the hard copies. Oh, no, those are the people who Online. only did a, oh. a print form, oh, like oh, the senior center. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I thought it was hard copies of all the people. Oh, okay. No. Printed out. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And just, for some reason, it doesn't work. I can just, you know, like it as well. Okay. 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 All right, so Marilyn. You're on it. I, um, Marilyn, maybe the first thing you want to do is um, set some goals for what you're yep. going to do, set a timeline, let us know what sort of assistance you might need, um, you know, sort of get some boundaries yep. around this thing. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. Yep. All right, it's 6 o'clock. We're now only five minutes behind time. So I think we're going to get out of here. Uh, all right, so I'm... Um, Per Todd's request, I put on the topic um, on the agenda of fundraising efforts and ideas. 
I have tried to reach out a second time to Durham, North Carolina, and I haven't heard anyone from anyone yet about um, this whole concept of adding a voluntary, um, what is, a voluntary donation to a water bill for the purpose of fund of tree of uh, tree fund. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that's I'll still keep pursuing that. I don't have anything to report on that. And then the other thing I wanted to just report is that uh, TD Bank has um, a national program that it makes, a, a granting program. Have you, have you taken advantage of it? Do you want to tell a little yeah. bit about it? Um, okay. okay, so they have their like, Urban Forestry Challenge grants that TD Bank and Arbor Day do together. It's like between ten and $20,000. We get funding for that for our bike brigade. Um, which I, yeah, it's like a, basically what we did is we had the local nonprofit um, hire a bunch of kids to go out and water the way they do Casey, Casey trees down in DC. They have these trailers and they have these like hoses and their vests and they just go around, they water trees. And that was, that paid for like buying, buying the equipment and like paid for their like hourly wage for the whole summer. Um, so we took advantage of that. Um, yeah, I mentioned it because Molly um, contacted me and said I Northampton qualifies for this grant, so it that is a possibility that we could use it for uh, for urban tree. Pl she had mentioned planting, and I didn't realize that you could you could apply for other. Because for me, planting wasn't very interesting because I had like more trees and I knew what to do with, but I didn't have a way of keeping them alive. Yeah. So yeah. so that gave us like 100 <laughs> trees that we didn't have to water. Yeah. Us. So I think you know I think that would be like a cool thing to do. But I mean, they're not as interested in tree plant based upon okay, not to be okay, not to be cynical. It's an advertisement for TD Bank, mm -hmm. um, so they're more interested in things that get lots of eyeballs and ways of penetrating the local market. So having like kids on bikes doing cool things with TD Bank as like a thing on their trailer was interesting to them. So that is something to consider. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I just want to throw out there that I have some moral qualms with TD Bank because they're a major investor in the Keystone XL, well, in the uh, uh, Tar Sands um, project. And so I have made a personal decision to boycott TD Bank and I'm part of a larger effort as well. Um, and I do realize that, that, that they're, you know, they're doing this so to counterbalance the bad press that they get um, from doing really shitty things to the climate. <laughs> Um, having said that, I'm one person and I have one opinion, and, and if the city wants to pursue a grant from TD Bank, I'm not going to stand in the way. Well said. Are there any other options? Anything comparable? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely funding. I don't think we would get it. I think they're more interested in large markets where there's a lot of eyeballs, and mm -hmm. there's also the whole redlining thing that they're trying to undo. I think there's there's a there's a reason why a lot of urban communities that are environmental justice communities get this funding, and the cut, part of it is settlements that remain with redlining. So what does that mean, redlining? Uh, large banks um, have sort of like a like a debt to society for years of not funding uh, mortgages, mortgages nice, small, nice. Businesses. small businesses with yep. underrepresented okay. people. Yep. I see. So communities like Holyoke could be a lot more interesting to them. Yeah. Or Chelsea, because it's right next to Boston. And it would be so much for two. I should make a plug. Okay. Yeah. Still Chester. I think it would be a waste of time. Waste of effort. All right. Good. That's my only. That's my only um, two points that I have personally to make about fundraising. Todd, did you have some ideas? Uh, well, uh, a couple of things. I just want to give a, an update on the uh, Downtown Northampton Association uh, as well, but. I do, you know, again, being a unique board and body, part of our mission is, along with volunteering, I think also the fundraising. So uh, however we can do that legally uh, by formulating systems to recruit large financial institutions and other, you know, corporate citizens of uh, the community to annually donate to uh, the Street Tree uh, Fund that hopefully is being created by something other than just fines is something I'd be very interested in like, kind of building up that support for and you know a couple you know three four five thousand dollar donations every year is going to add up to something quite significant and if there was a way to leverage that donation into 
you know, the advertising that they're going to want to see in the, in the, in the public good that they're going to want to be out there showing that they support this. Um, I just think creating that set of incentives and tools um, is important for us to consider going forward. Mm -hmm. The way I look at it is I completely agree with you and we're not quite ready to launch that yet because we, we are right on the cusp of being able to say this is our vision, this is our plan, um, you know, th this is all the foundational work we've done to launch a really effective program. When we have that and we can show that to those mm -hmm. potentially really big donors, I think they'll be ready to write really big checks. Until we have that, I think that we'll get small checks and we'll miss our opportunity for the bigger check. So I personally would love to hold off on doing that and approaching those, especially some individuals who I know really would love trees and have the, the means to, to give thousands of dollars. I'd like to just hold off a little bit before we approach them. That's, that's my feeling about it. Yeah, I think I agree with that mostly, but I do think some legal, just understanding where we're going, like what, what are our, how are we constrained to solicit funds? Oh, I see. You mean, okay. As a oh, uh -huh. right. governmental body we can take, and- We can take donations like in cash. As many, as much as you want, there's no limit. Yeah, yeah. Limiting factor is if I decide to give you a tree. <laughs> or if I give you a show. Give it no to deal. Rob. No deal, no deal. <laughs> no, I know that, but there, there are prohibitions against government employees soliciting donations. Uh, yes, there are. So we're not, but you have to. I know, I just, but I just want to make sure everyone yeah. understands exactly what, right. you know, what the plan will look like when we're ready to go forward. We have some foundational work to Yeah, I, I think we still do because I, you know, we have this potential city fund, which you're trying to make really separate. I'm trying to make it so we actually can just, re the money can stay in there and just be rolled over every yeah. fiscal year. If it's a general fund account, then the money goes back to the general fund and it gets reappropriated through the mayor's office, providing the council votes on the budget. This fund would stay in there, the money would stay in there, and it could just grow and well, be used for whatever we needed yeah. to. Uh, there, there's another way I know that another department slices it, and that is, are you all familiar with the Friends of Northampton Trails and Green Rays? Yeah. Okay, so they were established by an, 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 an individual citizens who wanted to support um, the city's effort to develop you know, greenways and trails and bike paths and so forth. And so they do, they're a very small non they, they establish themselves as a 501c3, and they're, you know, very bare bones. They're all volunteer, and they do a couple solicitations a year, and they bring in many thousand dollars every year. That They then, Wayne set up a um, community, uh, what is it called? Uh, community Foundation of Western Mass separate account for that money to be channeled into. And um, and then I guess he has the ability to draw from it. So it's it's not, it does not go into the city coffers per se. It goes into a separate interest bearing founda community foundation account. And, um, but I guess he's the only one that is that takes out of it for the purpose of like when there's you know grants that need a match or whatever kind of project needs a bump that he uses that money mm -hmm. for. So I don't know. I, I I do you want me to ask them a little bit about it just you to can. explore it? You can. Really you know, because some people are more comfortable with giving to a five hundred one c three than the city itself. They yeah. just well, you know, people, for whatever people reason. People their taxes, and I think that's enough. Mm -hmm. But they, I understand that. But I think one of the difference, the defining differences, is that the city. So these fines that we have are related to city shade trees that are public property. So the money has to go back to the public institution for yep. the property. That from. that makes total sense. So that may be kind of why this that's a little that's uh, mm. is a little different. Yeah. Because the actual bike paths in Northampton are not owned by the city. The city has a easement on them. They're owned by National Grid. What? And just another, just a, yeah. but be good to ask. But I, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to explore that just because I want to understand if that is a model that is worth looking into. If they're a, if they're a non-profit, why are they involving a government official? 
Um, well, because their whole purpose is to advance, you know, the development of greenways and trails, and and that's kind of the city's work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's not the only model. Like Friends of Forbes Library yeah. is a very similar model. Uh -huh. You know, where they are the they are this fundraising body, but they give it to Forbes for for their doing. Oh, yeah, it's overseen. All right. Um, Okay, any other business? And then we're going to listen to Marilyn do a recap on to-dos. Just, just real quick update on the Downtown Northampton Association, which had an announcement today, kind of uh, with a partnership of uh, in the downtown between the city, uh, the chamber, and then the members of the Downtown Task Force that have been building this Downtown Northampton Association. Um, so it, it relates to us tangentially, but there will be an organization now that's strictly in charge of the downtown. The city will be proposing an individual maintenance person for the downtown, uh, funded through the city. So there'll be kind of one person through the DPW who will be responsible for the downtown. That'll be supplemented by the DNA. Uh, so just pay attention to that and think about how trees interact with that as part of the beautification. and. Uh, kind of maintenance of, of the downtown and how we want to fit in with, with that going forward. That's a replacement of bid. Yeah. And what's, how are they funding themselves? Completely voluntary. Uh, there'll be the match from the city, from the maintenance person, the administrative function. It'll be housed in the chamber. The chamber will put up, uh, kind of the, allow for the administration. All the administrative costs will be borne by the chamber and then the DNA will raise its own funds through donations and then all the chamber downtown members will be shifted over to the DNA so that's DNA kind of the downtown Northampton Association okay so all, all of all of the chamber members who are downtown will be shifted into the DNA and that'll be kind of the foundation of the new organization mm -hmm. and then some groups has announced donations today uh, Thorns donated 10,000 as did Smith so this allows some people to not participate, as opposed to if you, if you don't want to participate, you don't have to participate. Right. Yeah. You just know who's uh -huh. the big change. <laughs> <laughs> the big change from the previous system. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's a wine-free organization. We don't hear any complaining. Yeah. Right. Just don't give any money. Good. Are you happy about it? Are you excited? Yeah, I think, I, think like it, I think it. I think it. I mean it. It's taken about six months to come to some yeah. conclusions, but I think given all, given the landscape that that, that downtown had, I think it was a, a good compromise, and everyone who had to step up stepped up. Yeah. Well, it, um, you know, as it shapes up, and you feel like there's an opportunity to talk to them about trees, let us know. Okay. Okay. To do. All right. Let me know if I missed anything. Uh, what I captured was okay. Rich is going to um, send GIS info via email to us commissioners regarding the nursery, uh, get soil samples at the nursery site, uh, and discuss with Wayne uh, the Kennedy Road issue. Uh, Andrew's gonna share RFPs with Rich for the nursery. Uh, Lily, Todd, and Jay are gonna help with the business plan for the nursery. Rob and Jen are going to review and report on the fall tree planting. Uh, Jen, are you drafting the thank you to the volunteers? Oh, uh, oh, uh, Rob uh, and I, Rob and I will do it. I mean, we'll do it when we Jen and Rob. Need. Okay, yeah. Yeah, but not, not the. To, to do. I cannot volunteer no, myself. No, no, no. The, the, there's two separate things. <laughs> yeah, and the thank one, you. No, the one is is the letter to the editor, yeah. and then another is going to be a blanket email we send out to all the volunteers. Okay. So yeah, we'll right. take care of the volunteer one. Okay. That's and then okay. we've got it, and I'll do okay. the public one. Yeah. Okay. That'd be great. And then I'm gonna. Um, review the survey monkey to see uh, if we need to extend a further month and then get going on this um, uh, analysis of You're the survey. Are you doing a letter to the editor or not that? I think a letter to the editor is probably enough it, for now. I mean, I do think that there's an op-ed brewing out there, but let's just quickly get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think in the interest of time, like okay. to keep yeah. the mojo going, yeah. I think we should just say, hey, thanks a lot. This was fabulous. We planted 80 trees. We're, yeah. you know, Smith Boat maybe in the level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. Did I miss anything? Um, I'm going to contact folks at the Friends of Northampton Trail and Greenwood. Oh, right, yes. Julia Reisman? Yeah, that's one of them. Yeah. OK, 
Okay, that's it. All right, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? All right. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>